Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today's video is a very special moment because if you're watching this and you're going in order, you have made it to the final topic in the AP course and exam description. There are 99 topics. This is the 99th. And again, if you're going in order, you have made it. This is the end. So with that being said, we'll get into human impacts on biodiversity. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe human impacts of biodiversity and ways to mitigate these impacts or these threats. And then the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will be proposing a solution and then talking about the consequences or the disadvantages and advantages of that solution. So when we think about the major threats to biodiversity on Earth, we have this great acronym of HIPCO, which can help us remember them. So the H stands for habitat destruction or habitat loss. So humans destroy habitats for a wide variety of reasons, which could be logging, could be agriculture, urbanization. Even when we dam rivers to generate electricity, you know, we impact the water level downstream. Uh, and so the H is habitat loss. The I is going to stand for invasive species. So again, this is largely due to human activity because we transport species around the globe in a way that was never possible before the global transport that, that humans engage in. So we have the zebra mussel, the emerald ash borer, kudzu vine. Remember that when we introduce these invasives, they typically outcompete natives. They typically consume food or other resources faster than natives can, and that's going to reduce biodiversity. Then the first P here is going to be population growth. So population growth, because human population is growing and expanding, kind of exacerbates all the other problems that humans cause in terms of biodiversity. So it's going to drive more habitat loss to lead to more urbanization and to grow more food for a growing population. So P here, population growth, kind of feeds into some of the other uh, causes for biodiversity loss. The second P we have is pollution. And I put in parentheses pollutants because remember in AP environmental, we always want to try to connect to specific pollutants rather than the vague idea of pollution. Um, so oil spills would be a great example. You know, as we need to supply more oil for more people to drive, the increased likelihood of spills is going to occur. We have pesticides, so I have some specific ones here. Uh, glyphosate, atrazine, these are going to kill non-intended target species when they run off of agricultural fields or when the wind carries these pesticides away uh, as they're being applied. Then we have the C, which is climate change. Climate change is a huge threat to biodiversity. Uh, it shifts habitat locations, it shifts biomes, it can remove certain habitats, sea level rise, uh, will lead to fewer coastal ecosystems as they become flooded and estuaries become flooded and, and more salty. And so that's another big you know, threat to biodiversity. And then finally, we have the O for overexploitation. So this could be over hunting, could be over harvesting. And so basically humans are going to a lot of times overuse species. And when we say that, what we specifically mean is harvesting them at a rate that's faster than they can repopulate. So we'll start out by taking a look at habitat fragmentation. So one cause for fragmentation is roads and pipelines. So when we drill for oil, we have to transport that oil, and we usually do that with huge networks of pipelines. Of course, um, we need roads for transporting, you know, all sorts of things, people, goods. And so both of these factors are going to fragment habitat. They divide sections of what used to be continuous forest or prairie, you know, into smaller subsections in between these roads or pipelines. We can see a great example of this from aerial footage or aerial shots of Alberta, Canada, where we know there's a lot of oil extraction. And so it's gonna chop this continuous forest ecosystem into all these little tiny pieces that are fragmented. And then another cause is gonna be agricultural land development. And so when we build cities, when we build more, or we you know put in more agricultural fields to feed more people, we're gonna fragment habitats. And so we can see an example here of what it looks like when again, we used to have a continuous forest ecosystem here, but as we cut down trees and put in all of these agricultural fields, we're going to disrupt that habitat. We're going to chunk it into a bunch of smaller, you know, stands of trees rather than a continuous forest ecosystem. And then finally, we have logging. So when we clear cut an area to harvest the timber, to use the wood, you know, we're going to fragment that habitat as well. So we can see here a great example of, again, these isolated stands of trees where what was once continuous forest ecosystem that allowed free movement of organisms that live in the forest is now you know, fragmented smaller pieces. So what are the consequences of this? Well, we're going to have these large continuous 
habitats that are now broken up and that disrupts animal movement. It disrupts hunting, especially for large predators. And it may even disrupt breeding if organisms are having a harder time, you know, finding mates. And we'll talk about a concept known as metapopulations. Um, first, I just want to quickly remind you of some info that didn't fit on the last slide, and that's that certain species are far more disrupted by habitat fragmentation than others. So large predators who need a large range to hunt for prey uh, and large case selected uh, organisms that have smaller population size, oftentimes, you know, they're going to be kind of disproportionately impacted by fragmentation. So now let's talk about a meta populations and we have a helpful diagram here to help us out. So if we look at the right hand side of this diagram, we have all of these isolated little habitats that have been fragmented. And so they don't have members of the subpopulations that live in these little habitats moving between them. And so that's going to cut them off from breeding stock, you know, from exchanging genetic information between these all of these subpopulations. So that's going to result in lowered, you know, genetic diversity. It's going to increase the likelihood of inbreeding depression when organisms are, are mating with close relatives. And so this is going to be harmful to the survival of these populations. On the left hand side of this diagram, though, we have more of a meta population situation. And that's where we do have some fragmentation that's leading to smaller subpopulations. But notice that they're connected by what we call habitat corridors. And so this is emphasized here by these stands of trees that are kind of linking each of these subpopulations and then the arrows moving between them. So that enables organisms to, on occasion, move between the subpopulations, and that leads to some gene transfer and some increased genetic diversity, which is going to make these subpopulations a little more resilient. It's going to make them a little less likely to suffer from inbreeding depression and a little more likely to be more diverse and more resilient as a population due to that genetic diversity. Next, we'll talk about something called the edge effect. So the edge effect is going to occur when two ecosystems meet. So it's when two adjacent ecosystems come together. And this edge habitat, as it's referred to, has some unique conditions because it has conditions of both adjacent ecosystems. And so we could have an edge where the prairie or the grassland meets the forest or where the ocean meets the shoreline or, or the mouth of a river. We would call that an estuary habitat. And so typically they're going to support higher levels of biodiversity because organisms have access to both habitats, have access to the resources and you know, the food supplies and the nutrients of, of both ecosystems. And so they can be beneficial in some regards. But one thing that we have to understand is that edge habitats often allow for the expansion of certain species that are uniquely adapted to those habitats. And that can come at the expense of other species. So a great example, kind of a classic AP environmental you know, case study here is the brown-headed cowbird. So the brown-headed cowbird is a brood parasite. That means that it lays its eggs in the nests of other birds. And so we have down here a picture of the brown-headed cowbird on the left. And in the middle, we have the brown-headed cowbird who has, you know, laid its egg in the nest of another bird. And then what we have on the far right is a brown-headed cowbird hatchling being fed by a much, much smaller bird who's kind of unknowingly actually raising the brown-headed cowbird rather than feeding its own young. And so the brown-headed cowbird grows up really fast. It kind of dominates the nest. And this is going to hurt the populations of songbirds that are often the victims of these brown-headed cowbirds laying their eggs in the nest. And so it expands the range of the brown-headed cowbird when we have these edge habitats because they really thrive at these grassy areas where the grass in the grassland or the prairie, you know, meets the forest. And so while that may increase their range, that's oftentimes going to come, you know, at the expense of songbirds. It's going to drive population decline in songbirds. And so the edge effect is kind of mixed, you know, it can increase biodiversity in some instances, but when it allows for expanded range of brood parasites, such as the brown-headed cowbird, that's going to decrease the biodiversity of songbirds. 